Hey there, I'm Dr. Patrick Kingsepp, and this video is a powerful mixture of four of Dr. Jordan Peterson's lectures. Now I've taken the, um, the best parts of these lectures and integrated them into my take on it. Now this includes the first video about how the nice person doesn't always win, the second part on how we are at times taken advantage of by others and what to do, the third part is about what we don't realize we're doing when we're trying to impress others, and finally, the fourth part on knowing who your true friends are. Enjoy the ride and please subscribe to my channel, like, comment, and be ready for future videos. Now this is the first video. The first part is on how always being a nice person doesn't always win, with some powerful tips on how to negotiate for what we need and want. Enjoy. That is what you should be doing, right? When you go out in your peers, you should be not subjugating your individuality to your peers, because that's not exactly right. What should happen is, let's say with your aggression, and hopefully you have some, is that it gets socialized. And so you, you learn how to play games, but you don't drop your drive to win. You integrate that in the games. And so you try to win, you try to play hard, but if you're defeated or you hit something negative, you don't respond negatively. And you can keep that all bounded within being a, fair, a, a good player, a fair, a fair player. And that means what's happened is you've learned how to play a game or a set of games that also includes the darker parts of you and they actually become part of your force of character it's way better if you can pull that off it's, and, and that's what you definitely want to do as an adult like all you people are going to have to learn to negotiate on your own behalf and that that's really hard it means that you have to know what you want you have to be able to communicate it and you have to be able to say no and to say no you have to be built on a solid foundation you have to have options so you, you got to remember that as you go through your life is like if you don't have options you can't negotiate with someone and if you're not willing to use them they win period because if you're asking your boss for more money say the answer is no because he doesn't have any spare money lying around that he can just give to you and lots of other people are asking and so you better have a case made it's like Here's why I should, here's how much money I should have, here's why. Here's the benefit to you that will accrue if you don't, if you do it. Here's the consequences that you don't, they're actually real, they will cost you, and I will do them. It's like, then you can negotiate. And you, you don't do that rudely, but those arguments, you better have them in order. Like, so for example, if you're going to negotiate for a raise or a, or a status shift, you better have your resume at hand, all polished up, and know where else you're going to look for a job, and you better be able to get one. Because otherwise you're just, you're weak, and you will not win the negotiation. And if you're too agreeable, so you're conflict avoidant, you will make less money across time. That's already been well established. And that's because you don't have teeth. Not enough. And so, in the little micro contests that you're going to have every day, you're going to incrementally lose to people who are more aggressive who have bigger teeth, and that's what happens, so, so don't let that happen, you want to you place yourself so you can negotiate, because otherwise you're just a facade, and in a real battle a facade is just torn down right away. This is video two, the second part on how we are at times taken advantage of by others and what to do. In this Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about the two personality traits of conscientiousness and the agreeableness trait. There's a conscientiousness trait and an agreeableness trait. Because conscientious people judge you on your accomplishments, right? They don't give a damn about your feelings, not a bit. It's like, are you doing the work or not? Whereas agreeable people think, well, you know, your mother's sick and you know, you've, you've got a bunch of family problems and, and we all have to take care of each other and it's no wonder that you're having a rough time. And Like, you can't say that one of those attitudes is correct and the other isn't correct. You can't say that. There wouldn't be those two dimensions if there wasn't something correct about both of them. But you can certainly point out that often they conflict. You know, and so the demand for, for inclusiveness and unity and care, and the demand for high-level performance in a hierarchical structure, they're very different orientations in the world. And so, it's complicated for people who are 
agreeable and conscientious. And actually, I think often that large corporations and large, large institutions of any sort run on the unheralded labor of people who are high in agreeableness and high in conscientiousness, and they're disproportionately women. And my experience in large institutions has been that if you want to hire someone to exploit appropriately, no, not appropriately, if you want to hire someone to exploit productively, you hire middle-aged women who are hyper-conscientious and who are agreeable. Because they'll do everything, they won't take credit for it and they won't complain. And that's nasty, and I think that happens all the time. And so one of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is not to be exploited. Because you'll line up to be exploited. And I think the reason for that is because you're wired to be exploited by infants. And so, that just doesn't work so well in that actual world. And one of the things, one of the things that happens very often in psychotherapy, you know, people come to psychotherapy for multiple reasons, but one of them is they often come because they're too agreeable. And so what they get is so-called assertiveness training. Although it's not exactly assertiveness that's being trained. What it is, is the ability to learn how to negotiate on your own behalf. And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh. And they probably are nasty and harsh. But they're also probably true. And you need to bring those up to the forefront and deliver the message. And it's not straightforward at all, because agreeable people do not like conflict. Not at all. They smooth the water. You know, and you can see, you can see why that is in accordance with the hypothesis that I've been putting forward. You don't want conflict around infants. It's too damn dangerous. You don't want fights to break out. You don't want anything to disturb the, the relative peace. You know, and if you're also more prone to being hurt physically and perhaps emotionally, you also may be loath to engage in the kind of high intensity conflict that will solve problems in the short term. Because a lot of conflict, it takes a lot of conflict to solve problems in the short term. And, you know, if that can spiral up to where it's dangerous, which it can, if it gets uncontrolled, it might be safer in the short term to keep the waters smooth and to not delve into those situations where conflict emerges. The problem with that is it's not a very good medium to long-term strategy, right? Because lots, lots of times there are things you have to talk about because they're not going to go away. And so partly what you do with agreeable people is you get them to figure out, and they have a hard time with this too. If you ask a disagreeable person what what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want, and this is how I'm going to get it. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want. Because they're so accustomed to living for other people, and to finding out what other people want, and to trying to make them comfortable, and so forth, that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own desires as they move through life. And that's not... Look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to uh, forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. This third video is part three, and it's about what we don't realize we're doing when we're trying to impress others. He also talks about the concept of the shadow, which is the dark side of our personality that we're not aware of. Enjoy. The first thing you have to understand with regards to trying to come to terms with the conception of the shadow is to understand the idea of persona. And persona is the you that you present when you want people to accept and like you. Let's say that you go to a party and you're trying to impress the people that are there and you're trying to get them to like you. And so you maybe get jabbed out a little bit and you laugh and you know you're, you go along with everyone so that they like you, and then you go home and you're bitterly resentful about the way that you were put down at this party. And th that's going to make all sorts of aggressive, I wish I could have said, it's going to make all sorts of aggressive and venge vengeful thoughts sort of flash through your imagination. Well, the first part of the problem is that you were too much persona, right? You sacrificed yourself in some sense at the party so that people would like you. And in the second part, you're refusing to admit to the existence of those elements of you that would have actually protected you from doing that. So let's say you go home and you're all bitter and resentful and you have fantasies of revenge. I mean, that reveals to you the shadow part of you that's aggressive. And the thing is, you actually need that because if you would have integrated that more successfully into your personality, when you went to the party, you wouldn't have had to let people put you down to get them to like you. You know, instead of having a face like this, which says, 
I'll take anything that's coming my way. You know, you have a face and a stance that's more determined and assertive. And if you manifest that properly, people aren't going to mess with you to begin with. But, you know, you may have already adopted a morality that says, well, I have to be likable and I shouldn't do anything that causes any conflict and I shouldn't ever, you know, hurt anybody's feelings. And so you're just to present yourself as a punching bag and you think that that makes you a good person, but it doesn't. And there's no integration of the shadow in that situation. Resentment is a really good emotion for making contact with the shadow side because if you're resentful about something, it basically reveals two things. It either means that you're immature and you should stop whining and get on with things. You know, someone's asked, this often happens with adolescents who are asked, say, by their mother to clean up their room. They get all resentful about it. It's like, shut up and clean up your room. You know, it's, it's not that much to ask. Or, so that can be a gateway into the observation of your own immaturity. Or, it's possible that you're resentful because people really have been poking at you too much and taking and, and taking shot, cheap shots at you and oppressing you. But what that means is that you've got some things to say that you haven't been willing to say or don't know how to say, right? You can't stand up for yourself properly. And in order to do that, you have to grow some teeth and be willing to use them. And again, that's something that might violate your morality because you might say, well, I shouldn't be able to bite people. And the thing is, yes, you should be able to bite people hard. And if you're able to bite them, then generally you don't have to. But they need to know that you can, because otherwise, especially people who are badly socialized, they'll just keep encroaching on you and encroaching on you and encroaching on you and encroaching on you until you, you put up a wall. Like s someone who's really well put together won't do that, you know, because they're sophisticated. But if you run into people who only have boundaries because other people impose them on them and you won't do it, you're going to be the bullied one in the office, for example. You're not going to get a raise. People aren't going to credit you with your own work. Other people are going to take credit for it. You know, and you're going to go home angry because you're doing your best and you're trying to get along with everyone and nothing ever goes your way. Well, it's because you're a pushover. And you think that's good because you confuse harmlessness with, with, with morality. It's, it's a bad, it's not right. Just because you can't do any damage doesn't mean you're moral. It just means you're, you don't have the capability for mayhem. And that makes you a pushover. I mean, the Jungian stuff is very, very dark, you know. It's very dark. Because his notion of what constitutes a moral human being is much different from the typical view. He really thinks you get that horrible side of yourself integrated so it's up there where you can use it. Because otherwise, you're, you're dangerous. You can't say no to people, and you'll go along with the crowd. And then if the crowd does something particularly pathological, which it's liable to do, you won't be able to resist it. You won't have the strength of character. And so then you'll fall prey to, to crowd pathology. And it'll be because you're too agreeable with a, you know, with a shadow resentful side that the crowd and its murderous intent is going to act out. And fourth, this is the fourth part of knowing who your true friends are. He goes on to talk about who to surround yourself with so as to help you grow. Enjoy. Here's how you know if someone's your friend. A, you can tell them bad news and they'll listen. They won't tell you why, you know, you're stupid and, and why that bad thing happened to you and how something worse happened to them once and, you know, derail the whole conversation. You can actually tell them bad news and they'll listen. So that's a good thing. And then this is a weirder thing. You can tell them good news and they'll help you celebrate. And that's a really good way of deciding who you should have around you. Because if you have someone around you, you know, something good happens to you and you're kind of afraid to even admit it because, you know, God, something good happened to you. It's like th you let that be known and it'll certainly be taken away. So, you know, you, you come out and you sort of tell someone half-heartedly that something good happened to you. and They, they give you a whack and then talk about, you know, so the great thing that happened to them three years ago. Or worse, the great thing that happened to someone that they knew three years ago. You know, it's like... Go away from that person. They're not helpful to you. And they're not helpful to themselves either. And so you want to surround yourself. You've got to think about this. You've got to surround yourself with people who want the best for the best part of you. You can hang around with weasels and losers that are trying to pull you down. 
to justify the fact that they're spiraling downhill as well. And you know, the upside of that is you don't have to have any responsibility and you can all whine about how wretched life is, you know, so that's pretty attractive. But I would say it's also a me bad medium to long-term plan. And so it's, it's acceptable and desirable to try to surround yourself with people who are facilitating your development. You know, and you might say, well, I've got people around, I know them well, you know, they're, they're, they're not doing that well, and, and, they're, and, and they don't fit into that category. It's like, what's your point? What are you going to do with them, exactly? If they'll, if they'll listen and cooperate with you and move towards a better future, great. If they don't pay any attention and they keep doing the same damn things over and over and they're not going anywhere and it's painful, then maybe the proper thing to do is say, you just have your misery. I'll go off and have my life and maybe you'll wake up at some point in the future and think that's a better way of being. Because just putting up with it is, all, well, they call that enabling, right? You put up with that sort of behavior, you're providing tacit consent for it and even tacit approval. It's like, it's a bad idea. You have, I would say, both the right and the responsibility to surround yourself with people who are good for the best part of you. I do hope you enjoyed this video by Dr. Jordan Peterson and you've gathered some useful tips and skills on yourself and what we do when we interact with those around you. Please remember to subscribe, comment, like if you did, and please take care. And bye for now.